Last year, I had the honor of working alongside my predecessor, April Sopkin, and the judging and selection of this year's debut novel, Bloomland by John Inglehart. From the very start of the judging process, Bloomland stood out amongst the rest of the submissions. An MFA student told me they read the book in one sitting. Others praised its beautiful prose. One even earned a sunburn from reading it on the beach. So entranced by the story, she simply forgot to move back into the shade. In preparation for tonight's event, I reread Bloomland, and from the very first page, I was reminded of why I fell in love with the book in the first place. Bloomland is a novel which on its surface tells the story of a mass shooting at an Arkansas university, but is much more than this one act of violence. It is a novel that confronts the topics of trauma and grief, love and relationships, that questions our society's expectations of men and women. It is at once a book about the individual, the college experience and coming of age, while also focusing on the greater systems at play, examining the impacts of classism, racism, sexism, and capitalism within academia and our society at large. It is a book about death. It is a book about injustice, about survival, about memory, and the human ability to delude ourselves, trading in our realities for those that are more desirable, rewriting our own histories. In his novel, Englehart creates a world for us where a bruised moon hangs ever high, illuminating the lives of his characters in its purple glow. As readers, we join the moon suspended in the sky, watching and waiting from above as he coaxes the story of Ozarka into bloom. It is through Englehart's exquisite attention to detail and his flawless execution of the second person that the story of four individuals is transformed into a singular shared narrative. We as readers are implicated from the start. The character stories become our own and the further along we read, the easier it becomes to see ourselves and one another recognizing both the good and the bad, refracting back at us. At its core, Englehart's novel is an example of what we all should strive for when tragedy strikes our communities. It is a reminder to avoid the easy answers. Instead, encouraging us to dive deeper, to look for greater understanding by analyzing ourselves and one another. The novel reminds us that only by sifting through the many complex layers can we learn how, over time, they've come to exist accumulating into one enormous dark and harrowing storm. In addition to winning the Cavill Award, Bloomland was also named a Best Book of 2019 by Kirkus Reviews, Electric Lit, and Thrillist. It was named an Indie Best Pick, and perhaps most importantly, was also the winner of the 2018 Dezank Book Prize. It was Dezank Books who first brought Bloomland to the printed page, and we'll learn more about this publication process throughout tonight's panel discussion. So, Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our moderator, curator of all things literary and owner of Richmond's new and used bookstore, Chop Suey Books. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Ward Teff. Michelle did a great job introducing Bloomland. I can tell you that I was one of the um, preliminary judges for, this is um, Swidgen, my cat, by the way, he's gonna be on my lap, apparently. Um, I was one of the uh, preliminary judges for the um, first novelist contest and took home four novels. And Bloomland was the first one that I read and I read it in two sittings. Um, I was uh, went down to visit my brother and definitely locked myself away to finish it. Um, it I, when I finished, I said, this is the winner. Um, and it was the first one I read. Uh, I was assuming, I did read some great ones after that, but. There's something about Bloomland. It's um, a fantastic book. So we're gonna talk about the book. We're also gonna be talking about the process of it being printed and written and um, how that goes. Um, we are gonna be talking with Michelle Dodder, Catherine Toombs and John Englehart. Michelle Dodder is the publisher and editor in chief of Dezank Books, an independent nonprofit press that champions innovative and award-winning literary fiction and nonfiction. She earned a degree in creative writing from Colorado College before beginning her editing career with noted San Francisco publisher, McAdam Cage. She worked with New York Times bestselling authors along with winners of the National Book Award, the Whiting Award, the Lambda Literary Award, and recipients of other honors. She currently lives in Colorado with her girlfriend. Catherine Toombs 
is a Seattle-based graphic designer and former childbirth, ed childbirth educator. Their work centers around human experiences, working to elevate the voices of individuals within the indigenous and sex worker communities. Currently, Toombs is a student at the Creative Academy in Seattle, where they live with their partner, John Englehart. And of course, our distinguished guest, John Englehart, is a writer and educator from the Pacific Northwest. He holds an MFA from the University of Arkansas and currently teaches writing at the Hugo House. His work has recently appeared in the Southern Review, Entropy, and Volume 1, Brooklyn. Bloomland won the Dezank Prize for Fiction, was a September Indie Next pick, and was named by Kirkus Review as one of the best books of the year. He currently lives in Seattle with his wife and his dog. So, um, John, I, I do have to start by saying um, your book is the kind of book I want to read, and it's the kind of book that I don't want to read. It's uh, I what I mean when I say that is we I heard you know when it was handed to me, it was explained to me that it was about a mass shooting, and that's it's such a tricky subject. And um, but the reason that your book is the one that I wanted to read and why I knew that it had to be at least a finalist, if not the winner, is that you handle it with such care and compassion while not being sentimental, while not pulling away from the cold hard facts that this is a horrible and very tragic event. Um, and to do that in a novel where you also feature uh, in second person, the shooter in, in a very compassionate, fair light, um, it, it, it blew me away and it grabbed me right from the uh, first page. So, uh, but because you as an author did not go the traditional route of publishing this, you didn't have an agent, you didn't shop the book around, or, or perhaps you did, but winning the, its publication came through the winning of the Desank Prize. Can you talk to me a little bit about the evolution of it, of the book from the moment that you started writing it, how it changed, um, the format of it, and how you and Catherine kind of worked together as um, they were your uh, kind of editor for this or your agent as a, as a first reader. And um, and then I do want to add Michelle into this question too, after you guys answer that, to find out how the book changed uh, in format from winning the prize to then being published. Thanks, great question. Um, First, I just want to say I'm really thankful to be here. It was really nice over this kind of cruel summer to have something to look forward to. Um, and I just really want to thank Michelle and April and everyone else associated with VCU. Uh, it's been great meeting with you. Um, uh, so the way that the book came to be, uh, I started writing it in 2014. Uh, I had just finished uh, grad school. I moved from Arkansas uh, back to Seattle. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, as I mentioned earlier. And I actually wasn't writing about a mass shooting um, at, at the beginning. I was writing about, uh, I wanted to write about higher education. I was really um, drawn to um, Northwest Arkansas as a, a setting, just because it's one of the beautiful, most beautiful, um, unsettling and complicated and misunderstood places I'd ever been. Um, so I was writing about higher education. I was writing about Arkansas. And um, some of the themes that I was working with were um, you know, the uh, dream or the myth of higher education, the, um, you know, young people trying to outrun their paths, uh, male entitlement, uh, male rage, and those sorts of themes. And um, so I had some character sketches, and then um, a number of shootings happened in the Pacific Northwest, um, Seattle Pacific University, Marysville High School, um, there was Umpqua Community College, and, and since those events were happening so close to home, I kind of started to think about mass shootings with a more heightened awareness and realizing that some of the themes I was already addressing uh, really directly related to that. So um, as a writer too, I think I'm, you know, really drawn to those topics that are shrouded in myth. And I think mass shootings and the, the complicated and problematic phenomenon of them is something that I think, um, uh, uh, defies immediate understanding and uh, continues to be this kind of cycle of short-lived outrage that we're trapped in. So as an author, I'm, I'm drawn to those sorts of topics because writing is my way of, of trying to understand um, uh, uh, something like that. So um, that's kind of how the idea of it came to be. And from there, uh, you know, uh, uh, Catherine and I have been together since the beginning of the book, been together since 2014. 
Uh, she is uh, the person who I gave every chapter to from the beginning, someone I can um, really trust um, as a partner to, uh, you know, give me her unvarnished opinion. And um, also to, I think her connection to the region, um, her um, spending, uh, you know, most of her life there growing up in Arkansas also really helps me. We can talk about that in a minute too, but uh, helped give me perspective for writing the book as someone who didn't grow up in the area and is quote unquote an outsider. So um, I think we can um, turn it over to, to Catherine or, or Michelle too to talk about the uh, later stages or, or kind of like um, what their input was, but um, I mean, yeah, just adding on to kind of yeah. what you're saying there, John, is like, um, I mean, like thinking about in more specific ways how the book really evolved. I think, you know, as John said, I think he really wanted to, long before it was even about shooting, I think it being placed in the South seemed really important to him because I think being a Seattleite, going to, you know, the MFA program in Arkansas was a very formative time for him. I think even when I met him and he was ending the MFA program there, he had such a strong um, group of people that he'd really connected with. And I think it, that's juxtaposed to when he first moved to um, Arkansas, you know, four years prior to go to the MFA program. I think his impression of the state, he did have a lot of um, assumptions that he made about it. That he was moving out to the middle of nowhere where a whole bunch of hillbillies were gonna be. <laughs> and I think, so that enamorment, I think it made sense why he really wanted this, even once we moved back to Seattle, like he wanted to be writing about that. But as John kind of mentioned, I think the early stages of the book and a lot of those early edits were kind of removing a lot of that um, outsider gawking that I think we can often unintentionally do. And I think it's especially really relevant right now with a lot of other things that's going on in the world and a lot of those polarizing ways in which we're viewing different parts of the country. I think that's something that, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you really wanted to be not having this book be casting a inherently negative light on the South in particular. I think this was supposed to be a more empathetic view of larger systematic problems. Um, and, you know, it's hard. It's hard because from an outsider, I think there was a lot of blatant things going on in the South that it's easy to point to, like, look at this weird billboard, look at how many Walmarts and KFCs there are. But, you know, if you live there, maybe that's not something you're pointing to all the time. So I think that was definitely a big shift over the years in editing. And Michelle, so um, you, uh, can you explain how Dezank uh, runs the prize? Were you um, one of the primary readers for uh, all of the manuscripts that come to you or does it get whittled down into a, a select few? And then um, also talk about reading John's book for the first time and, and how, maybe how it changed uh, towards publication and how you worked with him on that. Sure, yeah. Um, the prize is, is so much fun. So we run um, the Dezenk Prize for Fiction every year. And uh, it's usually run from early March to the end of September. And we get, um, we usually get about 800 submissions to the prize every year. And we easily get 600 of them in the last month. So there is quite a scramble <laughs> to read everything. And we, we usually announce the winner within just a few months. So it's quite a few books to get through. We have a lot of volunteer readers who help us narrow the, the prize down, but I'm, I don't know why. Um, I always look at them all anyway, um, because I just don't wanna miss something. So I actually had the good luck to be the very first person who looked at Bloomland. And it was, it's funny to hear you, Ward, talk about reading it for this prize, um, because very similarly, um, I read the first chapter of it when I was just reading around, getting a sense of what was in the pile. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's the winner, you know. Um, I read them all, to be fair, just to check, but it was, it was really no contest that particular year. Um, they're not always like that. Sometimes it's a, it's a steep contest and I don't know. We always have three um, guest judges who make the final selection for us. So I narrow the submissions down to five and then our guest judges vote and we tally up those votes. Um, and, and a lot of years, I'm not sure what's gonna come out on top. And this year it was entirely unanimous, which I think just speaks to the book's strength. Um, 
and and its complexity. And you know, one of one of the things that amazes me the most about Bloomland, uh, along with everything else that's being said, is um, John, you do an amazing job of of empathizing with your characters uh, without excusing them. Um, we are we are shown in no uncertain terms that these are are human beings, um, and they have deeply human elements to them. And human beings can still be terrible people, and you're not really asked to forgive them for that, but you do have to understand them. And that that level of insight and and empathy was just incredible to me. So when we did the edit, um, I have to say the manuscript was in pretty good shape. Um, I've worked with a lot of different authors. Um, some of them, we don't really do any editing at all. We move a couple sentences around. Um, some of them we do a major overhaul. This one was much more on the light side. Primarily what we focused on was digging into some of the parallels um, between the character who is the shooter um, and a professor who has suffered a terrible loss um, and, and kind of dealing with the ways in which those two characters have been presented with the same script for their lives in terms of um, what toxic masculinity asks of them, the ways that they are taught to process their emotion, and then asked in a way to consider whether there is any great gulf between them or whether it's just that one of them is holding the gun and the other one had someone they loved on the other side of it. And then juxtapose that with the primary um, main character who's a uh, female. And it's just, it's such a fascinating study of the ways that we are taught, raised into gender and gender as a social construct and all of the baggage that that brings along with it. So um, yeah, so we did a pretty minor edit really because it was all pretty brilliant already, but it was still a tremendous amount of fun. Um, and I loved working with John because he's one of those authors who can just dig into a tiny little scene and make some small adjustments and then the whole thing just clicks and it's perfect. Yeah, it, it did seem like it flowed as if you, it's like one of those novels that as I was reading it, it seemed like you just kind of wrote it like that. So I am interested in the um, editing process of that, that, that you and, and Catherine did, but I, would, I do want to also echo Catherine, you saying that um, you maybe were helping him or, or the manuscript went through changes where it was had to be less gawking or less about um, kind of the stereotypes of the South. But that's also, I guess, could be said about just the fact of a mass shooting and mm -hmm. the things that we associate with. And because John, like you said, unfortunately, these are things that hit our screen, hit our attention, and then we're on to the next one. Um, and they, they don't allow for that it's kind of a forward momentum of what's the next shooting going to be. You kind of work in a really nice way of where the, the book opens up knowing what's going to happen, knowing that the shooting, and you work backwards. You work towards it instead of, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, you do deal with the repercussions of it. But what, what was really fascinating to me is the compassion that you show the shooter and also the other characters of how they all moved to be part of that um, one event. Um, so did, is that something that was part of an initial draft or is that, is that something that you kind of came to with trial and error and you and, Kat, and getting Catherine's opinion on, on how it was reading? Mm -hmm. um, you mean specifically like how to, how to swirl around the event? Yeah, or how you kind of like digging into their past and giving the real compassion where you're not no one was a stereotype. No one was, um, you know, we, we you know who the shooter's going to be, but you really don't know much about him and the, the, the losses that he suffered. And that the, I'm just wondering, is that, was that a natural part of you looking into it or did that come from in different versions of it in later, later edits? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, from the beginning, once I had decided to write about a mass shooting. I knew that I wanted to not sensationalize it, and I knew that I wanted the event itself to take up less than a couple pages. Uh, and so, from the beginning, um, I wanted to focus on you know the social roots of the school shooting and the communal fallout. I knew I wanted it to be spanning over ten or twenty years. It spans twenty years, and um, I wanted that kind of circumlocution. Um, that kind of peeling back an onion way of telling a story. So the 
shooting itself as an event is kind of decentralized and not really, um, you know, so the book is more of a um, lens through which to view these kind of societal ills. Um, so from the beginning, that kind of structure was something I had in mind. It was, it was hard, hard to get there and to, to outline it so that it actually worked that way. Um, but I think that uh, hopefully answers your, your, your first question. Um, the second question kind of related to um, the empathy, I think, and, and Eli in particular, I, when I started writing the book, I, I wasn't going to write from Eli's, the shooter's perspective. Um, you know, I was reading about um, you know, the dangers of, of copycatism, um, the problematic phenomenon of mass shootings to begin with, the fact that it's really only the mass shootings perpetrated by young white men, uh, perpetrated in these culturally sacralized spaces like schools and government buildings and churches that really gets media attention. So I think I was very wary of giving him any kind of platform from the beginning, but the more I read and the more I looked inward, the more I felt that to dismiss him and to not get into his perspective would actually play into um, the the problematic phenomenon by doing this whole kind of us versus them, good guy versus bad guy, uh, you know, kind of dialogue. And at the end of the day, I think I had to look inward and ask myself, you know, what are the, some of the times that I have felt entitled? What are some of the times that I have reached toward anger and lashing out as a way to express my emotion? Um, or what are the ways in which I have been uh, acculturated um, and socialized to be someone like Eli? And so I think that's where I was able to, between my research and my own personal experience, um, try to offer understanding without, um, you know, condoning. So. And I think to add to that, I think it was, as far as the process, it was, you know, a as John mentioned, something I think from the beginning, you know, he didn't want to have that be this climactic thematic event in the book. However, I think, and this is something Michelle pointed to a minute ago, you have to like, I think drawing those parallels um, in these different characters' narratives was really important. And I think he knew there were certain ways he wanted to do that. And one of those was the perspective in which the book was written. And that was something that you know it, the book is written in second person um, and it allows each of these characters to have a very strong you know position in the book you know it, it's kind of like unbiased in that way but it also I think you know in those early stages of getting feedback from people I think it was really confusing for people that was something John really stuck to because he felt like it was really necessary um, however I think it was more in those later edits when we could like really nail down those parallelisms that we wanted to show that that allowed us to kind of get away from just like we're talking about school shooting we are talking about male socialization we are talking about and because that that's why it's necessary to have this you know female identified character going through her experiences of violence and how she grapples with that and i think it was something that john i feel like you were focused on mostly along the way, but it's still just, I, I think it, it wasn't until the later stages that was more refined and that really came through, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So was it always, did you start the, even before the, um, the subject matter of the shooting, was it always in second person, um, the writing of it and the writing of each character? Not in the very beginning stages, it was not. Um, I, I know Catherine remembers the first chapter uh, mm -hmm. I, I wrote was actually, I keep getting it mixed up because it, you know, the beginning was so long ago. But looking back, actually, the first chapter I wrote was um, a chapter where Eddie is grieving the loss of Casey, and he wanders off into an ice storm. And it's a chapter about um, Eddie and Stephen actually kind of like having an argument in the ice storm. Um, and that's now one sentence in the book. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it goes to show how wasteful writing is. But and that was in the first person. Um, and then Rose, the first Rose chapter, the chapter that opens the book was also one of the first things I wrote and that was written in second person. And once I had that voice, um, you know, and that first chapter went through some changes, but I think the way it came out, um, as opposed to a lot of the other parts of the novel was kind of intact. And once I had that voice, that 
powerful declarative second person voice. I thought I just couldn't get away from it. Um, and then at that point, it, it was kind of off to the races in terms of like justifying, uh, justifying itself. Um, yeah, I have to say that second person in Bloomland is one of my very favorite things about the book. Um, we're we're a literary fiction and an experimental fiction press, so we. We get all kinds of stuff in second person. And the book that won the prize for fiction the year before John is actually told in first person plural by a bunch of sentient cockroaches. So it's not to say that second person was particularly weird for us. Um, but what I love about Bloomland's second person is that you get to meet the first person behind the second person just a little bit at a time. Um, all second person inherently has a first person in it, but often that person is either invisible or it's just sort of an image of the author out there somewhere putting this on you and to get to meet that person who's speaking and who's imagining and to understand how much of this in many ways is Stephen's imagining. Um, I just thought that was incredibly powerful playing with a formal device for a reason um, instead of just, you know, seeing if you could pull it off. Yeah, that was an amazing shift that really you did so well, but before before you get to that shift, and even after, what the and I'm wondering, Catherine and uh, Michelle, if you experience this too, the second person really works so well in that you're telling the story leading up to the shooting, and it makes it seem like this is predetermined. You're watching an accident happen that you have no control over, that the character has no control over. They they're being told by the second person as they go forward that this is what is happening to you and this is where it's leading you. And for me that it, it, was, it was really an intense read because of that, because you connect with all the characters and you wanna say no, but there's this <laughs> narrator that's telling them what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it read like watching a, an accident unfold. Yeah, and I think that also you know, it allowed, I mean, I think like Stephen, you know, he is speaking from a place of having a level of perspective and a level of bias, but it's very clear that it's Stephen. And he, I think has, you know, uh, I think this is also something that enabled John to write Eli as a, you know, empathetic character and to feel comfortable writing about, you know, someone who is the perpetrator of a shooting and not feeling like you're putting them up on too much of a pedestal is I think you, I think John, you really leaned on that second person and Steven's ability to kind of apply this like checks and balances. Like we're in Eli's head or at least what Steven's kind of projecting into Eli's head or what we think, but there was always Steven there. And Steven I think was this person that probably is more aligned to, you know, who you are as an author. And I think that it, it didn't, I, I think that also enabled the ability or like enabled you to talk about and to have Eli as a central person without stepping over that line and giving him too much of a platform because you have Steven acting as a checks and balances for him. Yeah, I would definitely agree with all of that. And some of my favorite moments are when Steven's first person sort of ruptures through the second person in very interesting ways, like his court testimony later in the book. Um, it's just such an interesting and pivoting moment in terms of perspective. So really the book's just a great study in how well you can use unusual perspectives if you know what you're doing and you know what you want to achieve. Um, John, I do want to go back a little bit to the writing process. Um, as you were writing this, were you also trying to find an agent? Did you have plans? Um, what, what led you to uh, to send the book to the Zank uh, for the fiction prize. Um, can you talk about all the, the kind of technical parts of leading up to that sending it in? Yeah, absolutely. So I finished the book in 2017, in July, 2017. Um, and at that point, um, you know, I've always read and admire books from small presses, small presses like the Zank. I mean, I think um, a lot of the books that I was reading while writing Bloomland were from small presses and so I from the beginning was applying to open book awards from small presses like Zinc. Um, a lot of books I like um, from them from from Coffeehouse Press, Two Dollar Radio. Um, uh, so I was I, I sent queries to about 100 agents um, over the course of the next year and a half and um, it was a very long process at the same time I was sending um, manuscripts 
to uh, small presses as well. And so, yeah, I, I did want an agent. I did try to get an agent. I, I think that though, I always kind of uh, suspected that if Bloomland, if I if it did end up getting uh, published, that I suspected and, and, and hoped that it would be picked up by a small press like the Zank because those are the type of books that I read. And those are the type of presses that I think are are nimble and are um, a little bit more open as Michelle was talking about earlier to experimentation. A lot of the notes I got back from those many agents that looked at my book, a lot of them were excited about it and, and liked it, but almost all of them said that they were worried that they didn't think they could sell a book written in second person mm -hmm. or that they thought second person um, um, was this barrier. And, and, and sometimes they gave reasons for that. They said they felt too far away from the characters and that's something I, um, I and Catherine worked on in the year that I was, so as I was submitting to agents, I was also revising the book too. A um, couple of notable things in the early drafts that I sent to some of the first agents, you'll notice in the book, there's their character names um, after each chapter title um, that orient the reader. Um, before I started receiving those critiques from agents, those weren't there. And so each time you get to a new chapter, you would, as a reader, have to figure out who's mind you were in um that was really disorienting and then also a crucial thing that changed uh at the end before i submitted to, to the zank was that um chapter 14 um was not there um it actually ended with with rose and um it took a while for me to realize that um i needed to go farther into the future and wrap things up in a different way um and that just became especially once Michelle helped me work on it too, because that's one of the things we focused on the most, um, really became such a crucial way to um, really underscore the themes of the book. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, but. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and um, M Michelle, do you work with, uh, do, do most of your authors at the Zank, not just for the fiction prize, but do you have, a relationship with just the author or is there the agent intermediary and how does that differ for you as a publisher to work with the author? Um, yeah, we, we have submissions from both um, agented and unagented authors. Uh, pretty much the only significant difference is that um, agents can submit to us any time of the year and then we have some specific open reading periods for unagented authors and then they can join the contests. Um, we're usually about 50-50 between agented and unagented authors, but uh, having an agent doesn't really change the way that we work. I mean, I think one of the best things about working with a small press, um, at least I hope so, is that you get to be really dialed into this community of people who are doing this because they love it um, and they love all of the books they get to put out and not really because they're making any money at it, let's be serious. Um, but so working one-on-one -on -one with the authors and getting to really dig into their book and having that trust from someone who is giving you a book that they've worked on for years uh, and, and trusting you to help improve their vision is um, astounding. Um, so I, I have to say for us, an author having an agent doesn't really affect anything about our relationship, but I'm not really surprised um, to hear that John had a hard time placing this one with agents because I think, I think what is amazing about the small press community, um, Coffee House, Grey Wolf, just some of the presses that are an absolute inspiration to us, they get a chance to be the proving grounds. Yes, Akashic too. Um, for books that really everyone should be reading. Um, and, and we need to prove to the bigger publishers and to the world at large that these are books that can succeed and that people will love if you can just put them out there. Um, so I love being a part of that process. Um, Dezenk is a nonprofit um, and we are entirely focused on the quality of the work and, and what books are and what they can be and do. And that is really a dream job um, as an editor, getting to acquire books because they're amazing um, and not because of, you know, larger commercial concerns. Um, I didn't even know there was a job like that out there and I'm really glad to have lucked into it. That's really great. Yeah, I hadn't even, it's funny because the, the book is so strong and when you read it, it's, um, but I hadn't thought about the commercial aspect of it and, and very thankful for a, a publisher like you to be there um, to, to take the chance. Um, but and maybe this is an unfair question, but with your experience in, in the publishing world before Dezenk, how would you see this 
book changed if it was going to be marketed to you know by a big publishing house i mean is that an unfair question to ask or i mean obviously the second person would be taken out as john second said. person would probably be taken out um i i kind of hate to say this but i think the characters would be younger there's a book called This Is How It Ends. It's about a high school shooting that I think about sometimes in contrast to this. They're incredibly different books. That one is a YA book, but there's kind of no getting away from the fact that even without sensationalizing it, it's a book that the whole point of it is the shooting. Um, and, and even the lives that these characters bring into it are sort of small in comparison to that one big event. And I think if you're talking about commercial fiction, it can be hard to steer away from the really splashy subjects like that. Um, and that might be a super biased opinion from a small press person, so I'm sorry if it is. Um, but I guess that would be my concern with a book like Bloomland is that you might lose a lot of um, the deeper issues that you were trying to get to um, or, or lose the insight of multiple characters through this very interesting second person um, and, and have something of a more traditional narrative. Um, but the big presses are starting to do different and weirder stuff, um, thanks in large part to places like Grey Wolf and authors like Carmen Maria Machado pushing the envelope and proving just how amazing that can be. Um, so I hope that that won't be true forever. Good point. Um, John, I think uh, something that um, advice that is given to um, young writers is to write what you know. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that you doesn't sound like you experienced a mass shooting firsthand like this, but what what type of research did you do to prepare yourself to write about this? And and um, obviously the as as Michelle was pointing out the the shooting is not the center of it. I think your character study is much more of the um, intensity of it. But the shooting is still there, and the lives that led up to it are still there. So what what kind of research did you do for that? Yeah. The so. The whole write about what you know, I always kind of like my caveat is like, write, like write about what you know about what you don't know. Um, and so like me, it's kind of like, um, I, you need the raw material of your own life and you need self-reflection and you need to inject yourself into your characters. Um, but I also think a huge part of this book and all my writing is also combining the raw material with research. Um, and so uh, I, like I feel like a third of the books on the shelf behind me were 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 bought, um, uh, not counting the many I borrowed from the library uh, that I returned to them. But um, while I was researching the book, and so I, I took a really interdisciplinary interdisciplinary approach when writing the book. Um, I uh, started off with more kind of like sociological studies of mass shootings. Um, one um, written by Catherine Newman and a team of sociologists. Um, was really instructive to me. They were studying uh, mass shootings in uh, pre-Columbine mass shootings in um, uh, I mean, he, Kentucky and Westside, Arkansas. And they coming in those communities um, kind of um, already having armed themselves with the familiar kind of like these um, young men must have been bullied or must have played violent video games or must have had a mental illness. And um, all of those get quickly dispelled once they start talking to the community and actually going to the community and interviewing over 200 people. Um, so uh, studies like that uh, were really instructive to me, but then I, at a certain point, um, and this is where I'm at a sweet spot in a writing project is I just start seeing it in everything. Um, so I started um, to read, uh, like a, a one really helpful book for me was, um, the Will to Change by Bell Hooks, where she talks about male socialization. Um, uh, one of my um, uh, uh, mentors who I studied with at the University of Arkansas, Rilla Askew, um, her writing really kind of like, uh, you know, she's a maximalist and she also draws a straight line through history and in her writing and also talks about the way that, um, you know, our, this violence is in our blood and our soil and it's on some new phenomenon. Um, so, so her writing really was, instructive to me. I read a lot of poetry while writing the book because I'm really attracted to um, um, writing that casts more than one shadow. Um, I read a lot of C. Wright, um, Frank Stanford, uh, Two Arkansas Poets, uh, Adrian Rich. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I just 
one of my favorite parts about writing the book was was reading um, about it and then getting to a section about, um, you know, when I get to the prison sections and, um, you know, going to read New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander or, um, I don't know. So yeah, lots of research to, to cut it short, shorter, but yeah, thanks for your question. And I think like adding to that, um, like there was a period of time me and John, we were living in this like little yellow house. So, so we refer to it as that era, like yellow house era. <laughs> um, and that's most of the writing of your book happened when we were living in that little house. But there would be, I would say like weeks at a time when this was a little bit later in the writing, but he would just be watching all this like trial footage, hours and hours of trial footage. And and then also I remember the time frame when we were reading so much about like grief and grieving. Um, so like a lot of it, I don't feel like was like super, like there's just so much reading around like like school shootings specifically. I think there's so much surrounding it that like he did a lot of like holistic. I mean, obviously like the watching your trial footage that was all having to do with shootings that had happened but you know all these books on grieving and loss and you know the bell hook stuff like i just felt like that just like came into our life and it was just like everywhere and it was like as john said it was like the lens in which he was seeing the world and i think for every sentence that was put down there's probably 10 hours of worth of reading um that he did outside of that and i can vouch for that like i it was just yeah it took forever <laughs> so um but um, th this is kind of one of those um, vague questions as well, but what's your writing process like just in terms of the, uh, do you write every day do you for morning, evening, do you have any, any structure? I can answer that question. Okay, yeah. no, I'm, I'm like, he's very habitual every morning. No, <laughs> yeah, I, I could be habitual. Yeah. Um, when I'm into a project, I, I really like to, I, I write in the morning um, before um, my head gets, gets clouded with the day. Um, so I like to write for three hours in the morning. Um, in the before times, I would go to coffee shops um, a lot of times because I, I um, like that atmosphere. Um, and, uh, but yeah, in terms of my, my writing process though, I think that um, I uh, write a lot of notes in my notebook, which are usually just kind of almost like poetic phrases. Um, and when I sit down to write, I'm usually not that inspired by sitting down on my computer, but I can pull that out and, and um, um, I piece together language, I stitch together in a kind of collage type of way. Um, and I write really slowly because of that, but um, because I, I don't really like writing sentences that, that don't sing in a certain way, um, that's, that's kind of how it comes out for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're, I think we're going to uh, transition to the question and answer first, but um, I do want to ask two more questions. Um, one of just of you, John, are you writing anything right now? And are you looking, or are you working with, I guess I can, Michelle, not to put you on the spot, but are you guys working on a second publication or anything? I, I haven't heard anything about it, but I hope we do sometime soon. Yeah, you're right. I think we all do. Uh, I, I am working on something new. Um, it's really the beginning stages. I haven't, I haven't written anything in six months. Um, uh, it's been a hard time. Uh, so, uh, but the, the new project, I think it's still very much in the beginning stages, but one thing I've been thinking really hard about is that a lot of writing and my previous writing relies on um, tragedy and trauma for its tension. And I think in my next book, I want to um, write something that relies on um, a character kind of like actively seeking to um, live a more kind of like wayward, you know, outside capitalism, um, outside, um, you know, um, our kind of like handed down notions of, of identity, um, and having a character, I don't know, strive in that way, um, and, and fail or succeed, but having that kind of like someone with a, with an actual, with a vision trying to succeed and meeting obstacles that way, I'm, I think I'm wanting to write something with that type of tension. Um, as a kind of like offshoot, but it's, um, to think we'll be hearing about it, but <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, yeah, very much beginning stages. Yeah. Catherine, have you read any of it yet? Um, right. Yes. Well, 
Yes, it is very early. As you said, it, there's no like chapters or anything like that. But as far as those notes and gathering ideas, I think there's been, and I don't want to say anything more than what you said, but I feel like there's, there's definitely some themes that um, you were wanting to explore. And I think this kind of, some of it was kind of taken off of from Bloomland. You know, I think it really, you were really talking about male socialization and identity a lot. And then I think that's something that feels like you are wanting to explore more in this next book. And I think there's some themes of, yeah, just like male identity, sex work, um, those kinds of things. And I think a lot of that is kind of once again, pulling from very real experiences. And I'm excited to see what happens with it. Oh, that's fantastic. So um, for the, all the panelists, uh, what are you reading currently? Like what are you going to? Oh, uh, well, our our prize for fiction contest just closed in September, so I'm I'm reading 1,600 submissions for our for our three annual prizes. Wow. Good luck. Thank you. And I hope to talk to you next year for the mm -hmm. uh, same reason. <laughs> yeah. John and Catherine, what are you reading right now? I'm I'm making my way through. I'm still making my way through the collective homes of Adrian Rich. Um, I, I can't, I mean, it's hard to describe her genius, but I, even on a sentence level, I just, the way she uses compound words, leaf mold paradise. Um, there's a, a, a poem called What Kind of Times Are These that I feel like is really relevant. I almost read it to my students the other day. Um, uh, I, 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 yeah, I can't say enough about Adrian Rich, but I, I'm, I'm making way, my way through that tome uh, right now. And, and I hope it doesn't end. <laughs> No, that's great. Yeah, I think I'm kind of, I'm in a similar place as John. I think I'm, poetry is often something more I lean to. I think also with, there's, you know, with all of us, I think there's a lot going on right now. And I think um, I often look to poetry and I, some of my favorite writers, um, Anastasia Renee Tolbert, who's a local writer who we actually know, I have revisited a lot of their work and I think just as like little bits of solace um, and just like every once in a while, especially with my work and really busy with design stuff, being able to just step aside and kind of revisit more familiar things that I've read in the past. And I think, yeah, Anastasia has really stood out to me as of late. That's great. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to step away, but I, before I do that, I want to thank all of the panelists for being here and uh, for helping to put together such a fabulous book as Bloomland. Um, and uh, we're going to welcome Gregory Kimbrell back, uh, who's been monitoring the question and answers. And I think he will, hi, Gregory. Hi. Uh, you kind of, if someone hasn't asked the question, they still have a chance to, is that correct? Yes. I have several questions that I've gathered from the Q&A function. And audience members, if you have additional questions, please feel free to add those. All right. And so thank you, John, Michelle, and Catherine, very much for being part of this. Um, it was a true pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. So lots of the questions that we've gathered uh, revolve around second person perspective and also the character of Stephen. Um, so I guess. First, uh, I'll ask one more general question about second person perspective. Uh, are there particular second person novels or, or stories or other works that you found particularly influential in writing or, or that you consulted? Or is it something that, um, that you came to? Yeah, uh, I, I think most of my inspiration actually just came from not necessarily second person narratives, but narratives that were um, hybrid points of view. So um, I think that's one thing that I really admire. So The Revolutionaries Try Again by Mara Javier Cardenas, that book, um, you know, uh, uh, two kind of like um, young um, Ecuadorian kids um, dealing with dictatorship. Um, there, the way that story is narrated is so fascinating to me. And it's third person that veers into omniscience, that veers into third first person, that veers into kind of like um, these kind of like journalistic accounts of everything that's happening. I think um, 
I'm just really attracted to hi like hybridized points of view for that reason. And for like a consciousnesses that are blending. Um, so, so there's that. And then also I think one of the books I read but way before writing the book that um, I really love was A Visit from the Goon Squad from Jennifer Egan. One thing I really love about that book, there's an amazing second person chapter um, that's uh, really heart wrenching. And then there's also an omniscient type of chapter that um, it's about this family going on a safari, but it's freighted with all the knowledge of everything that happens 10, 20 years in the future of the family. And I love that chapter for that reason. And I, and I think that I um, definitely imitated that in my own writing. Um, I really like the idea of, you know, those like, you will, um, the kind of like, this will happen years in the future, but you don't know it yet. That kind of like um, omniscient, um, future looking declaration. So, um, so yeah. And then about Stephen, um, what do you imagine Stephen's um, reason for telling the story is? Why does Stephen feel the need to tell it? Hmm. Yeah, I think that ended up becoming just a central part of, of the novel. I think the novel is supposed to be about um, what is shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephen, I really wanted there to be a central consciousness to the book um, to kind of, I don't know, in, in terms of what artifice is, at the end of the day, no matter how much I have behind my characters, I'm the one telling the story. And at the beginning, I viewed Stephen more like myself. Um, but the more I got into his character, I think the more I needed him to be someone who, in mean, the book, conferences with the shooter days before the event and is telling the story because he's desperately trying to figure out why this happened and because he feels responsible. And I feel like having the central consciousness be someone who um, is confused and is who, who is angry and steps in and calls Eli an apoplectic shithead, you know, I, that person needs to be there because everyone I think imagining when I was imagining the audience read the novel uh, I imagined them having those thoughts so Stephen was a way from him from for me to kind of heckle Eli um, to stand outside of him and when he does something to have the narrator say and kind of fuck you but and also I empathize with you and also I'm kind of like you um, and have all those kind of different um, you know thoughts kind of scrolling around we also have several questions about process. Um, this one stud, uh, stood out to me. When you were writing the book, uh, obviously you shared it with Catherine. Were you sharing it with other people or did you hold it very close? Uh, yeah, I. so I, in the back of the book are all my, is a long list of people that helped me write it. This was something that I could not have write it. I could not have wrote alone. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, there's a long list of people that helped me out. Um, I was very lucky to be a uh, Hugo House fellow. Hugo House is a nonprofit writing center here in Seattle. It's amazing. Um, I uh, worked with five other writers who I really admired, um, who really helped me out. They were all working on different projects, writing different genres. And not only was their advice that they gave me very helpful, but um, reading their writing was very inspiring. Uh, and thinking about what their process and um, the topics that they were tackling was very inspiring to me as well. Um, there's there's people from my Edmund Freud program that were really in, influential, um, who I handed most of the novel off um, as I went along. So I, I crave uh, uh, feedback. Um, I, I know that writing for me is um, a process of um, showing and admitting my own ignorance to other people. And I, I just, I did very much need other people uh, to be able to write something, especially a book like this. So um, anyone who wanted to read it and give me their thoughts, I would send it to them uh, and ask for their opinion, so. I was interested too in, in what you were saying about uh, your research process and how uh, lots of material that wasn't necessarily directly related to the subject of the book became part of your, your research reading. Um, were, there, were there moments as you were working on this, and, and this is also for Catherine and Michelle, moments when you were reading this, 
when you had to take a step back for a kind of um, spiritual cleansing? Um, did you ever need a, a breather from the subject matter or did the process that you described of, of learning more about it and, and empathizing, was that, did that energize? And maybe it was both or neither. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's both. I, um, Catherine kind of mentioned this earlier, but um, you know, there's a courtroom scene in the book and I felt that I um, really had to do my due diligence and, and research courtroom scenes. And there's um, about 80 hours or so on YouTube of the James Holmes trial. And I felt, I, I, I watched a lot of that. And um, hearing the survivors, you know, one of the things about writing this book is that, you know, the cameras and reporters leave um, really shortly after these events happen. And, um, we don't really see the communal fallout. We don't really see how um, our criminal justice system forces uh, the survivors to relive these events over and over again and to relive the our collective misunderstanding of these events over and over again. And hearing the survivors give their testimony um, in that trial um, and have to revisit it was um, it was really hard. And I think after watching that, uh, I stopped writing for a few weeks. I didn't really write. I just kind of cried. And, you know, so, so yeah, there were different moments like that where um, I, I had to take a step back because it, it was difficult. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it was something I was still try, striving to understand. And I think that my fascination with it. And then once you, I think when you realize something is such a systemic issue, um, you, you start to see it everywhere and it just like, it won't go away until you keep at it. And so I think that's what um, made me start to be obsessive about the subject matter as well. Yeah, I think to add to that, I think it was, there was definitely at least a couple of times where I felt like it was, you know, it, it was really heavy. And I think he, John actually stopped a few points and kind of questioned why he was writing it, you know, why he was bringing this thing, you know, uh, creating this thing that was so heavy and, and, and was definitely a weight hanging over our lives. Um, but, but then, yeah, I felt like it's pretty exhausting how often, like, you know, you would go and check the news and something would happen. Like I said, even though this is these problems, you know, it wasn't just like the school shootings. It's, it's a lot broader than that. But I think once you see it, you can't unsee it, you know, and I think it was everywhere. And I think, yeah, but I think as far as that, like cleansing, it was, um, it was definitely a very dark period. Um, but, you know, it's, a lot of that's necessary and necessary re reflection as well. So I guess I have to be kind of the lone dissenting voice here, but that's only to say that I'm um, Literary fiction is dark stuff, um, and experimental fiction is pretty dark too. Sometimes um, we we run an internship program three times a year for students who are interested in working in publishing, and they come in and they help us read submissions along with other tasks. And sometimes they'll read something and say, "This was so dark I couldn't get through it." And I look at it, and it just like it doesn't even really hit me anymore. I guess because I've been reading super disturbing stuff for years. So. So this book actually doesn't even hit that register for me. So I, I really never needed to put it down. But there is a moment during the description of the courtroom scenes um, that just, it got me. It went right through the page. Um, and it's the moment, John, when you're talking about the first responders describing all of the cell phones ringing. And there was something about that that was so, real. I had to just put the book down for a minute and sit with that and with the reality of that. And I felt like I could hear those cell phones in my head. <clears throat> and that is just fantastic writing. So I didn't feel like I needed to get away from it. But yeah, you did occasionally get, you know, almost almost too good at what you were doing. Well, we are running out of time here. Did any other audience members um, 
have any questions. I'm just looking through the chat here to make sure I didn't miss anything. You have lots of kudos here, John. Lots of people who appreciated your writing exercises. Um, uh, Kate Brown mentioned that she adored the how to fall in love poetry exercise with school kids and had never done that before and wondered if you developed it. Uh, good question. I, uh, I can't take credit for that. I um, uh, was a, I, I did work as a writer in the schools in Arkansas um, in a program very much like the one that was described. And that was kind of like this, um, we did a lot of things to trick, um, <laughs> trick high school and elementary students into, in, into writing poems. Um, that, that was one of them, uh, kind of one of those exercises that was handed down um, uh, through the years. And um, I, uh, I loved writing that chapter. I loved uh, being a writer in the schools and traveling to different parts of Arkansas um, with my other uh, peers. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I came up with that on my own. It was handed down, but it's something I love doing. Well, with that, I'm going to turn things over once again to Michelle Goshen, and she will wrap up the event. Thanks, Gregory. Uh, just one more big thanks to all of our panelists tonight. John, thank you for being here. Michelle, Catherine, thanks, Gregory, for your technological support. Um, and also thank you to Catherine Ingracia and Tom Dodato for also helping this go off without a hitch. We also want to thank all of you for being here tonight um, and for everyone who contributes to the award. So thank you so much. It's been a lovely night. Oh, and Ward, of course, our moderator. <laughs> he, he disappeared, so I for, almost forgot. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night, and we look forward to seeing you again at next year's event and hopefully sooner. Take care. <laughs>